And I want to once again thank Rabbi Smith and all of you for giving me a great opportunity to share with you the holy words of the Alter Rebbe, the Balatanya. And we'll get straight, uh, go straight to the Tanya. The, we were learning, we left off the importance of saying, of being besimcha. The Alter Rebbe asks that if you're going to consider yourself a Russia, that you're going to think that you're, you're no good and you're evil and you did terrible things, if you're going to think about it all the time, how are you going to be besimcha? And it's so important to be besimcha. So Rabbi Smith asked me, I should talk, point out some of the practicalities of the, of the Tanya here. So one, is, one lesson comes up immediately regarding this point, because all of us are challenged many times about being happy. Simcha, it doesn't mean just um, uh, when, you know, that the Torah says you should be simcha, let's say, on the, on the Yom Toivim, or in Purim, or in Hanukkah, the Rambam says it's days of Simcha. Ayid has to always be besimcha. Simcha, in the broader sense, means positive. You get up in the morning, and you have a whole day ahead of you, and many things you need to accomplish. How do you deal with the challenges? How do you deal with the pressures of life? And all of us know that uh, the Yetzirah is very quick to make us feel negative, and worry, and have anxieties. So immediately, at the beginning of the Tanya, in the middle of, as he's asking the question, he's already pointing, he's giving us the outline of what he's going to be dealing with later on, the later chapters, how critical it is to be besimcha, to be positive. If you're positive in your, in your, in your outlook, and in your... Uh, feeling towards Hashem and towards people and towards yourself and towards life, then you could deal with stressful situations in a much more productive manner because you're not going to run away from the issues. You're not going to burst out. You're not going to snap. Uh, people deal with this all the time. So the Tanya is going to give us the, the tools and the practical advice and instructions how to be happy, but to be happy in a sense of bringing that happiness in everything that we do. The second thing we see in the, here, the first chapter of Tanya, he's explaining that a person sometimes feels inadequate. A person feels, uh, I'm, I'm not a good person. There's so many uh, people who are much better than me. and you feel inferior to them, especially when you you know you go to a, a, a shul. Then there's a very there's a lot of people there. There's good people there, and you feel I'm not on their level. So the Tanya deals with this issue as well, and it says that even big tzaddikim, like the Gemara says about the Rabbah, who was a person who never stopped learning Torah, he also said that I'm a Bainani. I'm not at a level of a tzaddik. Why? Because the definition of tzaddik, according to the Tanya, is not what most people think, that uh, if, you, if you do more mitzvahs, mostly mitzvahs, and you do a little bit sometimes something negative, you're a tzaddik. That's not a tzaddik. A tzaddik has a whole different definition according to the Tanya. But anyway, the point that Rabbi makes us feel that he also felt that he's not on the level of a tzaddik. And by him saying that, it shows us the humility. Even a tzaddik, even someone who's truly righteous, should always hold themselves on a lower level. But it is a fine line between that and feeling inferior. A person, one of the tactics of the eight Sahara is to try to tell a person, you sinned and you're a loser and you failed here, and you failed there, look back at your life, you made so many mistakes, and he wants to make us feel negative, and sorry for ourselves, and we shouldn't uh, be motivated to do good uh, deeds, and mitzvahs, and be positive, because 
it makes you feel rotten inside. So the Tanya comes along and says, no. I, that you have to know your level, but you also have to remember that even big tzaddikim, they also felt that they were not where they need to be spiritually, but that was all uh, 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 because of their humility. On the other hand, every time you do a mitzvah and every time you do something positive, the Rabbani Shalom takes it very, very seriously and very personally. Like he's going to say later in the first chapter of the Tanya, that every Jew possesses a neshama and the Yetzirah. The neshama is holy. The nefesh from the klipa is negative. So instead of focusing on your negative side and your failures and your things that make you upset, focus on the good uh, that you have, the resources, the potential, the blessings that you have. Instead of looking at the, ha at the cup half empty, look at it that it's full. How is it possible to do that? Because a person does uh, feel that they, that they have a connection with Hashem and that connection is what keeps us alive. That connection is what gives us strength. And when a person will sits down and contemplates a little bit during davening or now when we're learning Tanya or when before you go to sleep, when you say the Shema or whatever it is, take a few minutes and say, who am, uh, who am I? Who, what's my true essence? What is my true uh, being? What am I all about? I'm a Jew. I'm Hashem's child. I have the Neshama. Hashem trusts me and gave me the neshama that sustains me. And this neshama gives me koyach. And I am part, Hashem is in me. And Hashem is holding my hand. So even though I did things that are, make me upset and make me uh, negative, if I think about him, but I, I'm not going to go there right now. Hashem wants me to focus on the, on, the, on, the, on the good, on the positive, on the blessings that I have. When you think like that, and you focus on the kedusha that you have in you, the potential, the power of the blessings that you have, then even though every person, like he says here in the first chapter, has to deal with sometimes that we have anger and arrogance that comes from the from the fire in us and lust that comes from the yisoid hamayim from the water the, the, that that people have a lot of lusts and, and pleasures for things that are negative or to show off and Dvarim Betelin, to talk nonsense that comes from the Yisrael the Ruach and, and laziness and sadness that comes, all these things that we have to deal with, these are, these are attributes that we all have to uh, deal with all the time. We have to control it. We have to harness it. We have to figure out a way how to uh, balance it, that it shouldn't pull us down. So this is the answer, to the antidote, how to do it. By recognizing that all these negative traits that we have, we might look back and say we made mistakes. That's true. Uh, that, that happened. But Hashem is giving us the power to go beyond that. That, that to the, the, the gift that Hashem gives us his neshama. He, the neshama is a mamish, a chelik, a lakam, imal mamish, like he's going to say in chapter two. And if you think about it, how lucky we are, how privileged we are, how blessed we are, that Hashem has put his neshama into me right now, today, and he's given me koyach to learn Torah and to do mitzvahs and to, to, to have faith and trust in Hashem, you'll have the, the positive energy and the power to be positive and to overcome the negative traits that one has in them. So really, the Tanya here is dealing with something very fundamental because most people have this battle, have this conflict inside them, and they're mixed up. They want to do good, and then they want to do not bad, and then they want to be happy, and then they, they and then the Eight Sahara makes them sad. And, and, this, and there's a lot of confusion, and a lot of turmoil, internal turmoil. How do you deal with that 
a problem that is, you're not tranquil. If you want tranquility and you want peace of mind, you have to learn the Tanya here that gives you the tools by being the Simcha. And how do you get to Simcha? By learning Torah and doing mitzvahs and, and talking to Hashem and recognizing the great gift that you possessed in the Shama. This will give you the tranquility and the practical uh, solution to many issues that people go to psychiatrists, psychologists, the therapists, and all these issues that we have in society could be uh, uh, neutralized and it could be uh, very uh, much solved if we would practice what it says in the Tanya and in other holy svarim. I'm not saying that the Tanya is the only safer that deals with it. The Ramchal wrote Svarim, and there's Musa Svarim, but we're learning now the Tanya, which is, again, based on the writings the Alter Eberg says from the Merami Prague, from the Shalak Kodesh, from the Rambam, and from the Kisri Arizal. So this is, this, this is his way of dealing with these issues. And now, I'll tell you a quick story that's connected also with the, with the first chapter of Tanya. So in the, in the beginning of the, ta- at, the at the bottom of the, the, of the first page of the, the first page of the Tanya, the Alter Rebbe says that if anyone is able to learn Torah and does not learn Torah because they're not respecting the, they don't want to, and they're not busy doing anything else that's important, then he's considered a Russia, is considered, God forbid, an evil person. So I think it was 1956 or 57, my father, Zangazunt, was a bakr and he was working in a bakery in Yerushalayim. And the Rebbe, the Lubavitcher Rebbe asked uh, that every uh, person or every family that's gonna, is, is able to give a few matzahs, shmura matzah, or shmura matzah, for people, for, for, for families, or individuals who are not uh, going to buy their own shmura matzah. At least for the Seder, give the, the Chabad uh, organization should give out matzahs, two matzahs or three matzahs to every person, every family for the Seder, or if, they, if, they, if they're not going to get their own matzahs. There are people like that. They're not going to go spend money on it. Or they don't understand the importance of it. So my father was working in the bakery, and he met a rabbi, who was, I'm not going to say his name, he was very famous in the Shalayim from the Satmar or the Turikarta, and he asked him if he can give spare three matzahs. So the rabbi said, I'm not going to give to the Shoyim, to the bad people, I'm not going to give them my matzahs. They don't deserve my matzahs. So my father uh, was uh, t- t- uh, kind of brazen and, and, and chutzpedik, and he said, uh, you're also a Russia. So the rabbi, who was much older, gave him a slap in the face. And then he said, by the way, could you tell me why you called me a Russia? My father said, yeah, it says in the first chapter of Tanya, in the first page, anyone who's able to learn Torah, even for one minute, and they don't learn Torah. So they're also called a Russia. Are you going to tell me that you never waste even a moment you don't have any extra minute that you that you never find yourself not learning Torah. You're on such a high level. So according to the Tanya, you're also a Russia. So why are you con- looking at other people and pointing fingers and being judgmental that they're a Shoyim? And the next day, they printed in the newspaper in Yerushalayim that Alabavit Shabachar was slapped in the face because he didn't, uh, because he accused this famous rabbi and he said this, uh, you know, such a derogatory thing. He said he insulted him, but he wanted to, to get a, matz, a few matzahs for the people according to the rabbi's instructions. So take the story as you want, as you, you, you wish. It's an interesting story. I'm not saying you should call people to show him, it's not the right thing to do. But sometimes, you know, uh, when people look into the mirror, if they learn the Tanya, it shakes them up. They realize that uh, they're not such a big tzaddik. 
and they also have to do tshuva, and they shouldn't uh, judge others and make fun of others. Mind your own business, in a sense. I'm going back to the end of the first chapter of the Tanya. He talks about Goyim, which is also something very fundamental. Because according to the Rambam, it's a mitzvah to influence the Goyim to be righteous. So uh, how do we deal with that? Many rabbis uh, have, uh, have, have throughout the generations, throughout the centuries, didn't deal with this subject. But the Rambam says explicitly, halacha, it's a mitzvah, it's important, it's an obligation to influence the Goyim that they should be righteous and they should fulfill their mitzvahs for Hashem. So the Rebbe in the 1980s made a very big campaign that we should uh, talk about it and influence the Goyim as much as, much as we can without going into uh, religion to talk about the super being. He, the Rebbe said that every person should ha talk to Hashem and pray to Hashem. And in fact, he was even discussing about the Jewish children that are in the public schools. And he says that many of them don't get to talk to Hashem because no one gives them that opportunity. At home, it's not, it's not, you know, they're not practicing. And uh, it's not easy for these children. So the fact that they're in public schools, the Rebbe's position was that there should be a moment of silence and everyone should think at that time about Hashem. And they shouldn't have, they, they don't, no one's telling them how to pray, but that's the moment, that's one minute of silence when every child should connect with Hashem. Now, there were many uh, Jewish uh, leaders or, or, or people, organizations that were outspoken and went against this position. They said, it's not good. It's gonna, it's, it, we have to separate religion from, the, from, from government and from the public schools. But the Rebbe's position was that we're losing all these children, even the Goyesha children, that the whole new generation is growing up, not practicing every single day a moment of silence, which is a prayer to Hashem, to thank Hashem that you're alive, to thank Hashem for your family, to thank Hashem that, that you, for everything you have. So you see the importance of reaching Goyim. So here in the Tanya, he says a statement that the Goyim, the souls of the Goyim, of the, of the idol worshippers, they, they don't have any good in them. And even if they do good, it's for selfish reasons. He brings it from the Gemara, Baba Basra. But it's explained in the commentary to the Tanya that there is an exception to this general rule. The Rambam talks about Hasidei Umay Sa'olam. There are pious Goyim who are uh, guaranteed to have a share in the world to come. And we could uh, elaborate on it, but now is not the time. But this, is, this statement must be explained right here because otherwise we get the wrong idea from the Tanya. According to what it says here, there's no good in them. Ein behem toiv klau. So it says that that's a general statement, but there are exceptions. There are a lot of good goyim who do, do a lot of good for, 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 for society, and they did a lot of good for, for Jews. There were many goyim during the Holocaust that put their life in danger to save Jewish families. And the uh, Nazis in Machshimam, they said if they catch uh, a family protecting a Jewish family, they'll burn down their home and they'll execute them. And they did so. So, despite that, there were a lot of Jew, a lot of goyim who helped Jews during that difficult time of the Holocaust and other times in 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 history. And until this very day, the Rebbe says that uh, many times he mentioned that the uh, United States of America is a malchus shel chesed. It's a kind government. They help many people, including Jews who are. Here, we are all here in this country, we benefit from this country, and we have liberty and democracy, and we're able to practice Torah and mitzvahs without any restrictions, 
this is all thanks to the uh, uh, establishment of this country. So we have to thank Hashem that we live here. So we cannot walk away from the Tanya saying, there's no good in the Goyim. That's what it says here in the Tanya. Ain't behind Tev Klau. That's those people who are the Galulim. They were idol worshippers and they weren't doing the right thing. But for the Hasidic, for the pious, righteous Goyim who are kind and benevolent and they have faith, even if they have a different uh, way of worshipping because they don't know better or they're lost, they're, they're, you know, it's, we're not going to go into that right now. They, they, they're confused. But the fact that they 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 believe in Hashem and they talk to Hashem and they and they're kind if they don't hurt any 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 people and they don't uh, abuse anyone that they have the, a different category like the Rambam says uh, the right the kind people amongst the goyim have a share in the world to come. Let me see what time it is. It's ten fifty two. So now we'll continue with chapter two of the Tanya. Let me ask you, Rabbi Dolphin, so if you wanted to summarize chapter one in short, I guess the main point would be that uh, we have a Nefesh HaBahamas and it comes from, it, it comes from uh, the, uh, the, you know, it comes from the uh, Klippas Neuga. Would you say that would be like the main, if you wanted to, Oymed Al Achas, if you wanted to summarize it into one main point, it would be uh, uh, that it's the Nefesh HaBahamas. That you have to say both. The, the, to sum it up, is the, this is the this is the the like the the main point of what I see in the first chapter. He's g giving us the great news that every Jew, and whether he's a tzaddik or a rasha, has both souls: has the neshama elikis, and has a nefesh al bahamis uh, uh, that's in the blood. So this is great information because. This puts us on a on a higher, a much higher level, you know, knowing that uh, we have great a great connection with Hashem. At the same time, we also have to deal with reality. We also have a nefesh abamis, an animal in us that wants to do animalistic things. But he, we also have the godly soul in us that makes us so close to Hashem. Okay, shkoyach, shkoyach. Also, that, that the nefesh abamis comes from Klipas Noiga. I think that's a big chiddush that it's not just. Uh... You know, animalistic. It has that uh, mila. No, wouldn't you say that would be a main, main point? And it has uh, this midas tevis even come from the nefsha. Even our nefsha Bahamas has midas tevis. Okay. Yeah. I, I, it's okay. Interesting that uh, this is this is and the like, eight hadas. Like somehow, like that gives like the foundation of the whole sin of eight hadas. It gives us a little idea of the world uh, that uh, you know that we're trying to refine and elevate. No, that you it's wouldn't say. That's not the main point. Okay, I I would say the 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 main point is where he says that we all have two neshamos. Uh -huh. Okay, it's very uh, alarming to say that because you ask a regular person off the street who didn't ever learn Tanya, you have two neshamos. He says, "What? Do you, I, I have a neshama. What do you mean? No, he okay. says it. You yeah, have yeah. two neshamos. <laughs> yeah. Okay. 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 Fine. Yeah. Yeah. No problem. Uh, I also want to add that it says in Chassidus that on, on Shabbos, Shabbos Kodesh, a Jew uh, is able to connect with the neshama. Only with the, 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 the most of our neshama remains in Gan Eden. Only a small part of the neshama, the kiss, the godly soul, is put into the body. The, the main part of the neshama remains in Gan Eden. And it says that during tefillah in general... You, like the ladder that Yaakov Vinu saw, we have a connection with our Neshama in Gan Eden, and that gives us the strength and the inspiration to be more motivated to do mitzvahs. But on Shabbos, it says, uh, the Gemara says, a Jew receives a Neshama Yaseda, an extra Neshama. So most people think, oh, it's like a, a new Neshama comes in from Gan Eden, from left field, you know, Hashem puts the Neshama into you. No. Chassidus says, this is your neshama. But your neshama that's in Gan Eden usually remains in Gan Eden. It's, it's like, it's, it's too much energy to be contained in the body. On Shabbos and Yom Tov, Hashem allows 
the the neshama from Gan Eden, that's called it's called neshama yaseda. It's it's not someone else's neshama. It's your neshama, but it comes into your body, and you're more elevated, and you're more motivated, and you're more besimcha because you have more power, more holy energy from your own neshama. So we're going to begin the second chapter now. And, Rabbi Dolphin. Yes. Rabbi Dolphin. I just wanted yes. to ask um, if, a per, if a person's having an, a nefesh elakis and a nefesh of Bahamas, that's two nefesh, but could you say that it's still one neshama because it's, there's only one neshama and that's the, that's the higher level of the, of the levels, but there's, but there's a nefesh elakis and a nefesh of Bahamas that's part of that one neshama. Because if you're saying that there's an extra neshama on Shabbos, does that make that there's three? Because I thought no. the extra neshama only gives you an extra one, make it any two. Let, let's go back again. That's uh, I, I want to clarify it. Every that's the chiddush of this chapter of Tanya. Every Jew has two nefashes, two souls, two neshamas. One is the neshama likis. He's going to say later that rests in your brain, and the other one is nefesh Bahamas. It's the animal part in you that rests in your blood. The the functions of the body. Your, the Taurus is Kadam Hu Anefesh, that there's a soul in the body. That's why you're able to, to, to function. Because God forbid, if someone uh, bleeds to death, they die. So why can't modern science infuse him with new blood? And he should wake up. He, if, it's all, if it's all physical, he should be able to get back life. Just give him new blood. The answer is that Hashem puts a certain neshama, a nefesh, into this blood, and you could mix new blood, or new blood, if he's missing his original blood, I don't know exactly, uh, you know, the, the amount, but if he doesn't have even the minimum, Hashem made it like that. When it comes to Shabbos, it's not a third neshama. It's the same neshama that you have, but it's a higher level of the neshama, because the Gemara says, I mean, the Midrash says that every Jew has there's five levels to each neshama. Nefesh, ruach, neshama, chaya, yechida. And next time, Blineder, on Sunday, I'll go all more into the five levels of the neshama. But anyway, it's not a third neshama. It's part of your own neshama, but it's a higher level in your neshama, which is not usually available unless you dive in and get close to Hashem, and especially on Shabbos, Hashem gives us a gift that even if you're not, uh, you know, working so hard on it, but you're able to access it if you are Shema Shabbos and you want to uh, do the right thing, Hashem will give you this gift, this privilege, that part of your neshama, that Singan Eden, will be revealed on a more conscious level in your head, in your, in your mind, in your heart, and you'll feel it in your Avedis Hashem on every Shabbos. Rabbi Smith, Rabbi Dolphin, what I was asking was, there is, there's these five levels. There's only one Yechida, there's only one Chaya. I was thinking there's only one Neshama and one Ruach, but two Nefesh based on the Tanya. There's two level, there's two Nefesh of that level, but the other four levels, there's only one. There's only Correct. one Neshama. There's only one, the Neshama can't become impure, impure. So there, yeah. so there's not, it's not, it wouldn't be correct to say a Neshama that's evil, or a neshama that's, uh, you can say a nefesh ha Bahamas, but you wouldn't say a neshama ha Bahamas, or you should use a yetzah hara, but you wouldn't say a neshama hara. That's what I was saying. Yes, I agree with you. And that's why he translates it. If you look in the language of the Tanya, he starts saying, he brings a pasuk. The, everything that al Rebbe says, he brings a pasuk. Neshama is ani asisi. Shehein, shtei nefashos. He switches from neshama to nefashos. Because otherwise, it's going to get confusing. Otherwise, you're going to say, oh, I have two neshamas. No, you don't have two neshamas. It says in the Pasuk, neshamas, but over here, it means nefashas. Nefesh is the lowest level of neshama, and there's also a nefesh of Bahamas. So not to get confused, that the bottom line is, every Jew has two nefashas. One is nefesh of godly. One is nefesh of Bahamas, which is animalistic, which is in the blood. And on there, in the neshama, there's five levels of the neshama, and we will uh, go through each one of them next time. Bli
Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi Dolphin. Thank you, Rabbi Dolphin. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All the best. You too. Thank you.